Um, so now I've been asked to tell you, how did this report actually come about? And how did MIT address these problems and try to change the lives of the women faculty here at MIT? In 1999, that's quite a long time ago, so it's going to be historical. We're now down to history. 1999 is quite a while ago. MIT published a special edition of its faculty newsletter. And this consisted of a single article, and it was called A Study on the Status of Women Faculty in the School of Science. And it was a summary, really, of uh, the work of a committee that I had chaired, and then somebody had chaired after me. So four years of work of this committee. And the committee had been established by the Dean of Science at MIT at the request of the tenured women faculty in the School of Science. Okay. And I'll tell you how that came about. They believed that women faculty faced obstacles that male colleagues did not face in their careers. What they discovered was a kind of unusual form of discrimination, which had not been identified before then, really. And they called it marginalization. Today, we would call it unconscious gender bias. I went to college in 1960. Many of you were not alive, probably. OK, 1960. And there were essentially no women on the faculty of America's great research universities when I went to college. Women of my generation and background uh, were encouraged to get a superb education. And you might get an advanced degree. It would be very unusual, very unusual. Uh, I'm not sure I knew a woman who'd gotten a PhD in science. I, I don't think so. Um, but you certainly were not encouraged to go on and rise in the professions of medicine, law, academia. And for that matter, I think we tend to think of science and engineering particularly as keeping, but women weren't rising in art or music. <laughs> there were no music, there were no conductors, were, you know, so, so it was just the way it was, right? I was, uh, but, but monumental change was about to happen. I happened to come in at the cusp of a huge social change that was about to happen. Over the next 15 years in this country was the extraordinary Civil Rights Act of 1964 led by African Americans in this country. And women got tagged onto the end of it and benefited from this huge effort. Then came the women's liberation movement. And then, when that was insufficient, came affirmative action regulations. So those made it illegal to discriminate against uh, hiring people on the basis of race and gender. And it was the combination. It took all of these monumental efforts to really bring about this change. And I just happened to be there at that, that time. So I got a PhD. And then I was recruited to the faculty at MIT and Harvard. So it was exactly in this period of time when affirmative action was kicking in. Universities had to hire women, or they were going to lose their federal funding. So by God, they went out and they found some women. Okay, And there I was. I was standing there. So. Pretty much early on, not that long after I started, I have to say, I began to have some difficulties. And um, some of them were sort of obvious. I mean, you might imagine, OK, it was so unusual for people to see a female person who was a professor that, of course, they assumed you were the technician. Uh, so you were taking the packages and signing for, them for the help of everybody. You were doing all this kind of you know, sort of thing. But that was OK. That didn't bother me. Um, that was just you could understand why this would happen. It was just so unusual to think a young woman could actually be on the faculty. But uh, there were other things that happened that were rather similar but pertained to your actual work. And that was that your work somehow didn't seem to have the same value or weight that it did for when a man made a discovery. I thought, well, is it possible that this has anything to do with being a woman? I mean, this would be very surprising, because science is a meritocracy, I thought. You know, you do the work, you get the reward. That's how it works. And finally, the last straw was that I had co-developed a class with a colleague. And I was removed from teaching it because he decided he wanted to turn it into a company with another man. And they were going to teach this course and use it as a platform to develop a company. So I had to be removed so they could do that. And I said, OK, that's it. I'm done. And I decided I was not going to be a professor at MIT any longer unless somebody fixed this problem. I'd had enough. OK, so I sit down and I write a letter to the president of MIT. And I say, dear sir, I'm sure you're not aware of it, but you have a very serious problem here in your institution. 
there's a kind of discrimination going on, and it's kind of invisible. It's taken me 20 years to figure this out, but once I explain it to you, I'm sure you'll want to do something about this and fix it. So I thought, okay, well, I better run this by another woman and see whether or not it's polite and clear and shut. So I picked out somebody I thought would be a tough critic of my letter, and that was a woman in by my own department who I revered because she was the first woman um, hired in science at MIT to be elected to the National Academy of Science. So she should have been hugely respected. She was not, and I knew she was not, but I didn't think she knew, but I knew. And so I thought, I'm going to ask her what she thinks of this letter because she's a tough cookie and she'll be tough on my letter. So she'll tell me whether I should send this or not send this letter. So we go out to lunch, and I have the letter, and I'm, she's reading it, and I'm very embarrassed because in my generation, if you complained of discrimination, said you weren't treated fairly, it was assumed you weren't good enough. If you were really smart enough, of course you would just do the Nobel Prize winning experiment, win the Nobel Prize, you could overcome any obstacle. There was, must be something, you know, no, you just weren't good enough. So I thought, this woman's going to think I'm not good enough. She probably doesn't understand what I have figured out after 20 years, which is that nobody here is good enough, and it doesn't matter what you do, you're never going to be good enough, because that's the way it is. Okay. Anyway, so she's reading the letter, and I'm watching her, and she looked very serious. And I think, oh, God, she's thinking very badly of me. And then she puts it down, and she says, I'd like to sign this letter, and I think we should go and see the president of MIT, because I agree with everything you said. One person, maybe you've had this experience, one difficult faculty member <laughs> comes to you with some problem, you think, oh no, how can I assess the problem of this individual person? Now, there's two people, and they're coming together, and two of them are saying, and one of them's a member of the National Academy, and they're saying there's a problem, and they don't even work in the same field, and they both say they've got the same problem. Now I thought to myself, MIT's got a problem, <laughs> okay. And we looked at each other, and I think she was thinking probably the same thing. And a little light bulb was going off in my head, and I think, gosh, that's power. Now we got some power. Um, and if there were more women who agreed, we'd have more power, okay? So we, we made a list, we divided it up, and we each went out and talked to these women. And by the end of the day, we'd found 10 of them, and they'd all signed up. So the question was what to do, and we spent a summer getting to know each other and talk, talk, talking about how to solve the problem and determining whether it really was a common problem or was it each individual person's problem. It was there something common that you could solve. And we, we worked it all out and then we wrote a letter and we decided not to go to the president because it wasn't really his job to fix it, but to go to the dean of science. And so that's what we did. Here are, uh, is a slide that shows um, the incredible women in the School of Science who got together and uh, did this work together. So then what we were going to do, we, we decided to write to the dean and uh, ask him if he would give us a committee, because what we realized, they don't understand the problem. If we get together, we can document it for him, then he'll understand it, and he can fix everything. So that was our assignment to the dean, OK? Now, you can imagine how happy the dean was to hear from us, <laughs> OK? Well, he had heard from me before, and so he knew about me, he knew I was a troublemaker. <laughs> um, but he had helped me before, and as he says, now he's a good friend of mine, I talk to him all the time now, we became lifelong friends. So he said, um, you know, when Nancy, it's very hard when you came to me as this one ind individual person, did you have a difficult department chair who wasn't doing, was it you, what was the problem? I, it's hard to say. But when this group of women came to him with this letter, he said it was, it was a revelation. I mean, he knew he, that was something, a turning point in his life, really. And so he said, yes, you can have your committee, and you can study the problem. But it wasn't that simple, because his department said, oh, those women can't have a committee. How can they have a No, no, that's, no. There was opposition. This was, out of, was not the normal way we do administration here at MIT. Women asking for a committee, committee, women don't ask for committees. The administration decides what committees. So there was opposition. So he had to handle these department heads who were upset about this. So he did that very diplomatically. He uh, worked through it with them and set up a pre-committee and uh, so forth. And the committee met and um, collected two kinds of data, and both were absolutely critical. One was numerical data, and the other one was the stories of these women, the experiences they had had. 
Um, and that, the, many of the administrators said it was really their experiences that were more convincing than the data. For me, it was the data. Yes, the, the square feet, yes, it's right. But for the, um, for the deans, for the people trying to understand what it was like to have lived this life, it was the stories that told them. So we wrote it all down in a 150-page report. And uh, the dean said, uh, right, right away, he started to fix the inequities that were documented and in, in, uh, so forth. There were underpayments, which were shocking. I mean, just astonishing. There were these peculiar things. Women would get an outside offer. There was no counter offer. For them. A man would get the same offer with the second choice, and he would get a counter. Anyway, it went on and on. So he fixed all that, most of it. Couldn't fix it all, but he fixed a lot of it. Then he said, the answer to this problem is more women. So he went around to, he broke the rules again. He went around to all the department heads and said, I want a list of the most outstanding women scientists in your field in the United States or world or wherever they are. And he got the list. And then he hopped on an airplane and he went off and tried to recruit these women. Okay. So did that work? Okay. So here's a slide that's really kind of so shows some data. You remember I told you before, when I was in college, there weren't any women <laughs> on the science faculties of these great universities. Here we are in 1960 when I went to college. And this is the number of women uh, on the faculty. And the size of the school stayed about the same throughout. So it's about 270 faculty. So there was nobody. Then we had the Civil Rights Act, and then there was one woman. Then we had the women's liberation movement. Then, so t 10 years later, there were two women. Then we had affirmative action. And suddenly, <laughs> there were 20 women. <laughs> and then it stayed there for 20 years. And then we had the re little revolution at the School of Science at MIT. And we had the Dean Bergino bump. <laughs> Nothing more had happened. Um, things would have gone right backwards because almost nobody knew what had gone on. We were, the women were so afraid their careers would be damaged by doing this radical activism that they didn't want anyone to know about it. So we didn't talk to anybody about it. But this extraordinary woman did find out about it. A woman named Lottie Balin was a professor in the Sloan School. And she became the chair of the MIT faculty. And she knew about the work we had done in the School of Science because she was friends with a couple of the women in the group. And they had told her about it. And she understood, unlike those of us who, honestly, I just thought this was a bunch of little women in science. Nobody would ever care about them. But she knew better. She's a sociologist. And she understood that the problems these women were having were a problem of the whole society. It was the status of women in the world that was the problem in the United States, in science in general. It wasn't to do with MIT, so it had to do with the general status. And so she wanted all the people at MIT to know this had happened. She didn't want it to remain a secret. She wanted it to be public information within MIT. And so she asked uh, me if I would write up a summary of what had happened, a sort of narrative of, of it. And, and that was this report, which is you can get online, this is the MIT report. So I sat down and wrote the story of what, how this thing came to be. We wanted to be sure that when it, MIT heard about this, that they knew that we had worked collaboratively with the administration. It was not confrontational. It could easily have been. I seriously thought of suing MIT. I mean, I came very close to suing MIT. Because if this had not happened, I would have either had to leave MIT, sue MIT, or I don't know what I would have done, quit science. But, but instead, this happened. So it was this collaboration and this productive collaboration that led to the fixing of these problems. We wanted people to know. So that turned out to be the third turning point. There were many turning points in this story, but this one was the, the turning point, probably. And that was the courage of the president of MIT. And when he read this report, he wrote a comment to be published with it. And the comment said, I've always believed the contemporary gender discrimination within universities is part reality, part perception. True. But I now understand that reality is by far the greater part of the balance. The president of the university had come to understand this kind of invisible discrimination. And I, can, I remember Lottie sent to me his comment. I'm sitting at my computer. It comes in. I read this. And it was the other moment of changed my life. I mean, I never thought it would happen ever that a president of a university would understand what this was about, much less publicly endorse it.
then he said what you do is his mechanism was you take somebody who really understands the problem, in that case he took me, and he said, and partner them with somebody who has the power to fix that problem, and at MIT that's the provost. The provost is the powerful academic officer. So I'm going to establish a committee, a council, and you'll co-chair that council with the provost. So suddenly I went from being the activist professor to sitting at the highest level of the university helping devise policy to solve the problems on the previous slide, and that's what happened. So the report was mailed out on a Friday afternoon electronically to the faculty, and Sunday morning it appeared, a story about this report appeared on the front page of the Boston Globe, which is our local newspaper. So that was pretty scary right there. Two days later, it appeared on the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> but more overwhelming than that was the email response that came in as a result of this publicity. And it came from women, professional women, scientists, um, engineers, people working in labs, people from many different lines of work. Just a deluge, and it came to me because I chaired the committee, it came to the dean, it came to the president of MIT. And these letters really all said, um, well, you won't believe it, but the same problems exist in my university. And I keep trying to tell people, and nobody will listen to me. Nobody believes me. So this turned out uh, to be really a universal problem. And the moment that I finally understood that you could have equal work, and it could be valued differently if people thought it was done by, I thought to myself, that's the most important discovery you've ever made. That's an insight into how the human brain works. I'm a biologist. I thought, wow, that's really interesting. And that does explain this problem. Um, and, but what I didn't know was it already had been discovered. There was an entire literature on the topic. I just didn't happen to know about it, OK? Psychologists had figured it out years before. And they knew you can take a manuscript, you can make Xerox it, you make two copies, and you put the name on it, John Doe, you know, John Smith wrote this one, and Jane Smith wrote this one. You send them out to reviewers, and people think the same manuscript is better if it was written by John Smith than Jennifer Smith. OK, so uh, they already knew it. In fact, a Nobel Prize was given for this uh, research on the unconscious bias of the human brain. It's one of the um, really remarkable um, discoveries, I think, about human nature, really.